Uh, my name is Clint Williamson. This is Toby Bernard. We're both at South Tech Systems. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to go into corrosion, internal pipe corrosion, which is obviously a huge issue in the industry, um, and where we fit into it. If you go into a few different testings that have happened, third-party testings, um, as well as our, our, our own results, as well as um, some case studies from the actual industry for people that have used utilized nitrogen to mitigate internal pipe corrosion. Down here, I see in South Florida, there's not as many dry systems, if, if any, but you still do have reaction systems and hospitals, server rooms, things like that. So it's still something that needs to be talked about. The first part is about the dry and pre-action systems, how we're handling that. And then toward the end of the presentation, we'll go into wet systems corrosion, which corrosion isn't as big of a deal in wet systems, but it is still something that needs to be uh, taken care of. So feel free to stop me at any point and ask questions, or if uh, you want me to dive a little deeper into something, if I'm going too fast, please just let me know, because I know this is definitely, um, it's not as um, widely known down here as, as it is up in the Northeast or in different parts where dry and pre-action are. I mean, these things are specified in almost every new design build up in anywhere north of Richmond, Virginia. So this is obviously why we're, uh, why we're here, this kind of pipe corrosion. It's, it's not something that, it's not just the cost of replacing pipe, which is more what the guys at Sprinkomatic and contractors would be worried about and the end user. When we're talking about engineering, if you designed a system and it's like that after 10 years, it's not going to work the way that you designed it. You're talking about reduced C factor, you're talking about water not getting where it was supposed to be in the proper amount of time. So this is just a couple different studies, FM Global. There's, uh, there's way more wet systems than there are dry and pre-action, but 60% of the fire losses caused by corrosion are in dry and pre-action systems. So it is much more prevalent in dry and pre-action as opposed to wet. Uh, VDS, just so you know, that's basically their FM in Germany. Nothing goes into a German fire protection system anywhere in the country without VDS's blessing. Um, 70, almost uh, three quarters of dry and pre-action systems they inspected after 12 and a half years had significant corrosion issues. 12 and a half years, that mirrors the third party testing that we're about to dive into here a little deeper. As I just mentioned, it's, it's more than just the cost of constantly maintaining pipe, having someone in there. Uh, on the weekends, holidays, when pipes either burst or there's leaks, things like that. So it's, it comes down to water being able to get where it needs to be in the proper amount of time. This is just to, to go over, I mean, just like a fire triangle, there's a corrosion triangle. A huge buzzword in the industry for a very long time now has been MIC. Um, contractors and users, oh, we have MIC in the water. There's, there's bacteria in the water that's causing this corrosion. MIC is an actual thing, micro, microbiologically influenced corrosion but it's not where corrosion starts. It can really only make it worse. Where corrosion starts is if you have metal, water, and air. Oxygen is the driving force behind corrosion. So you can't get rid of the metal in dry and pre-action systems. You can't get rid of the water either. There's always gonna be a residual moisture there. So where we come in to prevent this process from taking place is replacing oxygen with high purity nitrogen. That's the only thing we're doing to these systems. So that's something to keep in mind as we go through this. There's a lot of misconceptions about nitrogen generators. Well, they completely change, change the fire protection system. No one will be able to work on them or install them, maintain them. We're gonna go through that so we can kind of take away those kind of misconceptions as we go. So you see back here, this is the setup. We, uh, when we got into the industry about 10 years ago, we decided to partner with a metallurgist out of Boston, Massachusetts, that set up these corrosion tests for us, long-term corrosion tests. There's three sets of Schedule 10 galvanized steel and three sets of Schedule 10 black steel. Every six months, they cut away a section. They cut it right down the middle. They take it, they, they're able to measure the corrosion rate inside that pipe and get a really good idea in terms of all the data that they have about how long that sprinkler pipe will last. So this is the longest running testing in the industry and we'll get into here how we've actually changed the industry with this testing across the board. So three sets of steel, one under compressed air as normal, one under 95% nitrogen. The reason we did that is because when we entered the industry, there were companies providing nitrogen fire protection systems at 95% and then at 98%. So those are the three sets for both Schedule 10 and Black. Compressed air, 20 years service life expected. That's pretty standard, get a lot of head nods. I give this presentation to contractors, engineers alike all over the country. 15 to 20 years is what you can expect out of Schedule 10 Black Steel. Uh, with compressed air. When you go down to 95% nitrogen there, 
I mean, you're getting maybe five extra years out of it. You're really at that point, is it really worth it in terms of putting that, that system in? And it's, you're not really getting that much bang for your buck. 98% nitrogen, you can see, I mean, you're not talking about a couple extra years, you're tripling the life of the pipe. So that's a, that's a huge deal. And just so you know, as received and cleaned, they're just getting rid of that superficial buildup, that corrosion buildup, so they can actually test the results. So that's just a, the breakdown of those slides. But tripling the life of Schedule 10 black steel. In black steel, really what you see is uniform wall thinning. There's air, there's water, and there's metal. It's, it's going to start the corrosion process. It just thins it out until eventually it starts to peek through. You either have a leak, an air leak, or an actual, uh, if it's significant enough, low air alarm, and then the system trips. This is a little bit different than the corrosion we see in galvanized steel. So galvanized steel for the longest time was touted as being the solution to corrosion. And it, I mean, it's become more and more obvious to everybody in the industry that it's actually the exact opposite. Uh, I actually get a lot of scoffs and, and laughs from contractors when I give this presentation. They're like, yeah, try two to three years before you start seeing pinholes in galvanized pipe. Um, the reason being, you can see it's not just uniform wall thinning with galvanized steel. If I skip over here, it's localized targeted corrosion. So anywhere where that galvanic layer, that zinc coating that's supposed to protect the pipe is compromised, chipped in installation, if it's rubbering the, the larger pipe, it's shipping, whatever it may be, the corrosion pinpoints that weakness and you get basically a boring effect and it turns these things into mist systems in a couple years. Um, but as you can see, 95% nitrogen, again, you're adding a couple years, so what's the point? 98% nitrogen and you turn galvanized into what it was supposed to be. It's the, that silver bullet for corrosion. It's, it's really going to be, it put the, the expected life of the pipe well beyond the life of the building. So you don't ever have to worry about it. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm familiar with a building in, in downtown Miami mm -hmm. and, and it's a high rise, it's 47 stories. Mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, it had the Allied XL, galvan that's galvanized pipe. Okay. Like this, and they used uh, a dissimilar T. Okay. Um, they, um, Finished the building, system was not put in service, so the pipes were there, the windows were not in, and it sat for over a year with no windows in that salt air, mm -hmm. and they're having a, now that it, it's a wet system, Okay. but now they're having a, a ton of trouble with the corrosion. Yeah. Internal, One, not external, correct? Internal. Yeah because the pipes were not filled with water for over a year. Yeah. Are, are we talking the same thing? Absolutely. In one year's time, can this occur? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if the job's big enough, they, contractors are already replacing pipe they started they the getting as, as, when they're finishing the job because of these pinholes. And it's because of that corrosion and process. It, all, it can just take just a year. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yep. It's a, and it's just, I mean, this is, and these, these tests are basically generous from what, from what we, the feedback we get. Um, but so, and it really is, it's that oxygen air, and obviously the salt adds a little bit to it as well, um, in terms of if there's salt water getting in there, that just extrapolates that pretty, pretty quickly. So, but yeah, so this, when I give this presentation, the feedback we get is, all right, well, what do, we, what do we recommend to our clients? What do we recommend to our customers? It really depends on the situation. There's, there are still situations if that pipe's exposed, otherwise you still need to use galvanize if it's a, um, say a parking garage exposed to the outdoors if it's in a port or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but for best cost to benefit ratio, Schedule 10 black steel and a nitrogen generator can provide significant cost savings. I mean, you, you know as well as I do that every project gets value engineered at this point. There's still customers that don't know any better in terms of, well, we, just, we know that galvanized steel is what we should do, so we're asking for that. You can always give them that proposal. You can also come, hey, this is black steel and nitrogen generator here's why we're suggesting this to you and the job's large enough you can more than make up the cost difference between black steel and galvanized i mean that's 30 35 percent cost difference um, and as well as if they're going schedule 40 you can go schedule 10 and with nitrogen generator and still get that kind of life cycle out of it so this is where a lot of our contractors that have used our equipment win projects left and right because even if it's not calling for nitrogen they're going to submit as an alternate and then they, they get that project because they're looking out for the long term of the customer, everything like that. So this is what we suggest. Obviously, if you are going to go galvanized steel, really the only way to go is with nitrogen to actually make it worthwhile. The other benefit of this, obviously not an issue in South Florida in terms of ice plugs and freeze ups uh, <laughs> for dry systems, but 
you do have a lot of cold storage freezer warehouses down here. Nitrogen also beyond the corrosion aspect of it gives a, it, the added benefit of it is it has a low dew point as a gas. So if you're putting high purity nitrogen in there, you don't have to worry about the moisture aspect of that and you don't have to worry about ice plugs and freeze up. So really the only other way to go with those drying, those uh, freezers and cold, cold storage warehouses are either the, um, what are the, I forget what the name of that, the, what is that chemical that they glycol? use? Glycol? Well, yeah, glycol, glycol. which uh, you can use glycol, which as far as I know, they're, they're stepping away from in terms of there's no, not, there's no listed chemicals anymore in terms of what you can do. You can maintain them if they're in place. But then they have the, uh, the dry air pack kind of things, which they're, they're somewhat effective, but they require daily maintenance, that kind of thing. They're, if, you, if you ever talked to any contractors that have had to deal with a desiccant air dryer, it's a nightmare for them. So this is just an added benefit of it, of nitri utilizing nitrogen in systems. This is just to give you a background of why places like Sprinklermatic, engineering offices, end users um, go to us for this kind of this kind of education. We're a nitrogen generator company. It's what we were founded on. It's we have over a hundred different product lines, all of nitrogen generation. We're not a valve company. We're not a switch company. We're a nitrogen generator company. This is just to give you an idea of some of the other. Uh, third parties that are constantly in our manufacturing in Wilmington showing us, they're letting us know that we're doing things the right way. FM, UL, CE we just got, so now we're the nitrogen generator that's being able to sell in Europe as well. Um, PSA technology is something I'll touch on. It's the reason we have more nitrogen generators and fire protection than all of our competition combined. It's because it's a technology that we are the only ones that bring it to this industry. Um, but just to give you an idea, of this, is, this is our expertise in what we do. Just to give you a few things, any bag of free delay you ever open, Doritos, things like that, that's South Tech nitrogen that comes out of there. They blanket our chips. They have these generators that are about a story tall, running 24 seven, blanketing different bags of chips. Uh, Buffalo Wild Wings, they have generators, our generators in there providing gas to push the beer from keg to tap. Um, heat treatment, laser, like I said, just to give you an idea of the scope of what we do, every single one of these applications requires a different pressure, a different purity, a different flow. So in fire protection, you saw the purity level just from 95% to 98% is, is very different in terms of the effectiveness of the equipment. Now, after this testing and after others have mirrored this testing and got the same results, every nitrogen generator manufacturer in fire protection offers a minimum of 98% because of that testing. So that's the minimum it can be to actually effectively inhibit corrosion. This is obviously more what you're here for. Data centers are huge, probably in 65, 70% of the data centers in North America. Um, cold storage, as I just mentioned. Everything else on here is more dry systems that would be in place that wouldn't be in Florida, in, in uh, South Florida anyway. But nursing homes are one of our biggest um, applications just because they all have that dry attic system where they're, they don't want people crawling up or placing pipe above patients' rooms, that kind of thing. Hospitals, anywhere where they're going to be there for a long time. Military bases, they actually changed their code on the military bases from Schedule 40 galvanized steel and an air compressor to Schedule 40 black steel and a nitrogen generator because we've done dozens of their bases at this point. So just to give you an idea, anytime if you're working on one of these applications, you can always use this as a resource. We have high visibility references in each one of these. If it's a stadium, we're in Lambeau and Wrigley Field. If it's a data center, we're in Equinix locations, all, all of their locations in North America, that kind of thing. So just let us know where we can uh, help in terms of references if your customer wants to know. This is just a breakdown of how the system, how we're not really changing the system. You see an air, a standard fill air compressor. It's going in into the system to provide supervisory pressure per NFPA code, 30 minute code. You're doing the quick fill. All we do is as soon as that system is up to pressure, the nitrogen generator takes over. Supervisory pressure from there. That's, that's all we're doing. You see the storage tank here. You'll also see it in our cabinet here. Um, there's actually, this generator is, uh, we didn't bring the storage tank, but there we provide a storage tank or a buffer tank with every single one of our generators. It's not a high pressure cylinder. That's a common misconception. It's a low pressure storage tank. Basically, so the generator is maintaining supervisory pressure. Regardless of the system, there's probably gonna be a leak rate, depending on how old it is. It could be aggressive leak rate. The generator will only kick on because of the storage tank when the tank reaches a certain level of pressure. That's to prevent short cycling of the air compressor, the generator, increasing the life of the system, basically. Just that one added thing will increase the life of the system. It'll also reduce the runtime. Our generators, on average, 
no more than three to four hours runtime a day. Our competition, 12 hours plus because of certain tweaks like that. We size our equipment based off of NFPA 25 leak rates. So more, the existing systems, that amount of leak rate, no one else does that. So basically every system that's put in place is gonna be undersized if it's, a, if it's an existing system because there's going to be a, a leak rate there. So no matter, regardless of who it is, you're always filling the system with, with compressed air first, you're bringing it up to pressure via code, and then you're backfilling with nitrogen. So where do we go to get rid of that, rid of that compressed air? We have purge devices on every system. So that's what goes on there. We recommend a remote end of the system. It can be placed anywhere along that system. We recommend a remote end for customer peace of mind, say near an inspector's test board, something like that. That way the customer can be sure that the, gener the nitrogen is reaching the far ends of their system without having to go into a, a fixed law of diffusion chemistry conversation with the customer. Yes, sir. How come they don't mix? Is, it, is the nitrogen denser? Why no, it will mix. Push it? Yeah. Oh, it will. It, it does. So, yeah, there gases want to mix almost instantaneously. Okay. But so, just to be, make sure that they say, say there's a water trap in a remote point in the system. If yeah. you have the the purge device in the riser in the riser room, which you can do that, the gases will mix. But then there's no way of saying to the customer like you're absolutely positive that there's nitrogen out there. Right. That's why we just do it there for everybody's sake. If it's at the remote end, they can't say that they're not getting nitrogen through remote points. Yes, sir. So as you fill the system up with nitrogen and you know contractors, everybody's there looking at this thing, mm -hmm. to get to that 98% level, yep. you need to be able to test a purge point to and, ah, some dial, some crazy yep. box. No, 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 great, great question. So we say on average, it, that's obviously here, since it's compressed air in there, 79% is what nitrogen is for just atmosphere, right? So it's gonna take a little bit of time for it to reach that 98%. We say two weeks on average. If it's a 50 gallon pre-action system, it's gonna be up to purity probably that day. But so we provide actually, so with these purge devices, and excuse me, we provide a handheld sensor with every generator that we provide. So basically it's a handheld battery operated sensor. It has a tube, you press one button, okay. you hook it into this, it calibrates, it'll tell you. So when you first turn the generator on, it's going to say 79%. If it doesn't, then that's weird. But uh, it, you know, after after a certain amount of time, if, if people want to come back and check it the next couple of days, maybe it's at 85%, maybe it's at 93 And then as you go, at, after two weeks, it should be at that 98% or above. Now, now when the, the contractors you know, start doing his pressure tests of mm -hmm. the piping system, make sure everything is secure, mm -hmm. uh, leaks don't join us, he's doing that with normal air correct from his own systems yep and then at that point once everything is proof positive the owner the authority having jurisdiction says hey thumbs up we're ready to go then you guys come in and you do your magic yeah so and we don't we don't get involved we don't require our people to install because it's very plug and play you're basically putting this in between an air compressor to do the 30 minute fill and an air maintenance device mm -hmm. so it's before the system actually starts but we actually took what Toby does and he and he'll be back in Florida next week to do another one of these we do start with commissioning to make sure everything is installed correctly, everything's piped together right, and then really run through with the installing contractors, the maintaining, whoever, the, maybe the facilities managers that are going to be doing that. That's something that we offer to, our, to the customers to do. It's not something we require, but it is something that we offer. Okay. Um, but yeah, and then we recommend checking this purity on a quarterly basis. That's entirely up to the contractor and their customer. It could be yearly after a while, whatever they want to do. We just recommend quarterly just in case there is something going on in that system. Maybe there's a significant leak in one branch and it's not, it's not actually getting up to that purity or it's constantly running, that kind of thing. We do our purging a little different than some of the other companies. Ours is completely pneumatic. Some require you to find electrical and they, that somewhere, wherever you're installing that, it might be a little bit more difficult. Ours is completely based off of pressure. If you have a nozzle here, there's a chart that says, if say if it's a 50 gallon pre-action system, you're going to only open up that purge a tiny little bit to an acceptable purge rate. If it's a thousand gallon dry system, you're going to open that a little more to have a more significant purge. So you're basically creating a, an acceptable leak rate for the system to, to make sure you can measure it, to make sure that that gets it, to get out there to that remote point. We re, like I said, we recommend a remote point. It doesn't have to be uh, a high point, anything like that, just as long as it's not somewhere where water is gonna, going to collect. Vertical, horizontal. Part of our other suggested maintenance is the, uh, checking this Y strainer, quarterly, yearly, whatever it may be, especially in existing systems, when you're putting nitrogen in there, you're going to be drying out that pipe. There might be, it, there might actually be some 
pimples that are covered simply by other corrosion that you dry out, that's going to end up somewhere. It's most likely going to be a that Y strainer. So you want to clean that out on a semi-regular basis. This is the, the uh, purity check that I, that I told you about. So that's great if it's one system or if it's say a, say a three story parking garage, there's three stories, each purge device very easy to get to. If you have a hospital or a, say for Equinix down there, for they have co-location co data centers, they don't want people crawling above their server rooms and like maybe knocking over a, uh, knocking a sprinkler head, it's billions of dollars information. What we offer, this is an optional, is a purity manifold. This might be what you were referring to before. We run tubing. We, we provide plastic tubing from this purge device back to a centralized location. So this can monitor up to 20 different locations at a time. You can label each zone. This is wing A, wing B. Wherever you have these purge devices, if you don't want someone to be there checking purity manually at each one, this will do it automatically once every 24 hours. It will actually open the purge device, sample it. If it's at 98%, close it, move on to the next one. If for whatever reason that one zone is not up to 98%, it'll leave it open for till the next purity period, just to make sure that it does have that proper flow. But this is not a requirement, it's just great technology that we offer that no one else does that is an option if, if somebody wants to. I have a question. Yes, sir. If the system is leak free, so there's no leak at all, mm -hmm. and you reach the 98%, uh, 98 plus percent mm -hmm. of nitrogen. Does that generator never run anymore until you know? It's yeah, run? it's. I mean, it's going to maintain supervisory pressure just like an air compressor would. So it's not going to change that at all. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It'll it will only run to maintain that pressure. It's not going to continuously run just for the sake of running. All right. And like I said, we provide the tubing. It will run back from the purge device back to the centralized location. The other great thing about this is that it provides remote monitoring capability. So say you have a college campus with eight different buildings, they can have one of these in each building. They can have somebody localize, hey, building three, zone two is not up to purity, maybe we can have somebody do that. We have places where, the, where we have contracts where they're in all over the country. They may have a centralized headquarters where they can say, hey, building eight in Ohio is this, that. So it's just, it's another added bonus to be able to track that on a, on a wider scale. Uh, this is where I'll actually get into the way we're creating nitrogen because basically nitrogen generator is kind of a misnomer. It's, it, we're not generating anything. What we're doing is separating nitrogen from the air that we breathe. It's already 79%. We're just getting rid of that other 20% yeah, that, uh, that is not nitrogen. So how do you do that? There's two different ways you can do that. You can separate the nitrogen via a membrane filter, which is right here. Thousands of tiny fibers about the size of human hair. Nitrogen goes in one side, nitrogen will take the path of least resistance, follow it out. Everything else that's in the air we breathe will try to escape. We'll, we'll try to get out these weep holes. That's how we separate the nitrogen. Uh, this has been around forever. Uh, we still use it in certain applications. We used it in fire protection when we first entered the industry. That was simply because we didn't have the technology to actually uh, bring our more advanced technology that we use on some of the industrial large-scale applications, but now we do. Um, this is still what everyone else in the industry uses. It's, it's membrane, it, it works, but because it's a filter, it has some limitations. Uh, just like any other filter, it's susceptible to get gunked up. Uh, oil, particulate, moisture, things like that uh, will affect that purity level. And you saw how important even 95 to 98 percent is. So the other thing about these membranes is it requires quite a deal from from the air compressor, 125 plus PSI forcing air through this membrane. So when these when generators first came into the industry, we well, yeah, that's great, we understand nitrogen, but we've had to replace the air compressor five times okay. because you're, you're trying to do this over and over. So it, it's the same thing in bars and restaurants as well. What we did was, and we did this in bars and restaurants as well, so we have that advantage. We switched to PSA technology, which is called pressure swing absorption. So what you have here is two sieve beds, these silver cylinders here, which Toby will actually bring you guys in and let you see how the system works. On a higher level, they're filled with carbon molecular sieve. If you picture chocolate sprinkles in an ice cream cone, they're made of carbon, they're very porous. You pressurize one of these beds, all of the other 20% of the atmosphere that we breathe adheres to those, to those little, say basically sprinkles. Nitrogen does not, and that's how we separate it. It's a more efficient process 
two to one air to nitrogen ratio as opposed to three to one. The big thing, it requires about half from the air compressor. You're talking about 70 PSI instead of 125 plus. And because it's constantly swinging, the pressure swing absorption, it's not that constant force from the air compressor. So the air compressor lasts longer, it's not working as hard, easier to get the nitrogen out. The other thing is it's much less susceptible to those oil particulate moisture, things like that. And then this material that's inside these sieve beds lasts 20 to 25 years, as opposed to eight to 13 years lifespan for, for a membrane. That's if we say when designed properly, when we used membrane for fire protection, we had a refrigerated air dryer. We had three sets of filtration before that air even got to the membrane. Companies don't do that. So eight to 13 years is the max for these. You're talking about if it's just air from one of those air compressors that you've seen in riser rooms, dirty oil, like that's going in there, you're not gonna have that lifespan. So more than doubling the lifespan from, for, our, for our equipment, holds purity longer. It's just a more efficient, more effective way to do that. We are the only ones that have been able to shrink that technology from a story tall, things like that, to this size. So that's, what, that's our main technological advantage over, over the rest of the industry. Our, this is the uh, this is the model right here. Just to give you a scale, this is nice to have actually have this because this doesn't really provide scale. That is the middle tier unit there. This can handle up to 900 gallons. We have our our model numbers are incredibly. We try to make things as simple as possible. FPS 900, 900 gallons total capacity. Just to give you an idea, when you're specifying a generator, 900 gallons is total capacity. So that can handle one 900 gallon dry system. It can handle 10 90 gallon pre action systems we'd still provide one generator to provide the supervisory pressure for all. But you would need, if there's multiple, you would need one of these per zone. I'm yes, trying to explain this mm -hmm. strictly as an awareness level, just okay. so they know what they're looking what at. What is this red box in the right yeah. room? Yeah. Could I, inter yeah. instead of using the word sieve, with the carbon pellets in there, mm -hmm. could we call that a scrubber? Yeah, I don't see why not. Okay, they, they yeah. understand scrubber. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I, I wouldn't imagine that you'd need to get into that deep just in terms of, hey, we're separating the nitrogen in there. But yeah, yeah absolutely. It goes through a scrubber yep. and, it, and the non-nitrogen gases are absorbed. And just gets, and then okay. as, you, as the pressure releases, it gets expelled. So okay. no, yeah, okay. perfect, that's fine. So this one over here can handle up to 1,650 gallons. We have multiple, these aren't, we don't just have these three units, but these are the different sizes. The ones on the right, we have 16,500 and 22,500. These are our stock models. Because we're a nitrogen generator company, we can always go bigger. I think the largest one we made for fire protection was a 50,000 system. It was for some ridiculous uh, distribution center that had 80 systems, something like that. But you know, we can always do that because we custom build these things for other applications all the time. But this is our, these are our stock models. A 500 and 900 in this model. So 500 gallon is obviously the, the smallest that we go is for plug and play applications. There's already an air compressor there doing the 30 minute fill. Put this generator in there, in there, in between that and an air maintenance device. You're good to go. Uh, the larger systems, when you go above 1,650 gallons, we provide the air compressor that's going to do the 30-minute fill because it's also going to provide the feed air for the nitrogen process. This one and this one have an internal air compressor that's doing the nitrogen part of it. So any air compressor will do to do the 30-minute fill. But if we're involving the, the compressor into the nitrogen process, we need to make sure that we're providing the industrial grade compressor, proper class feed air, everything like that. So that's just for the larger systems, we also provide the air compressor. And just so I can understand, when you say gallons, that is the volume of air in the piping system? Water capacity. Water capacity. Water capacity. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, the other thing is, a lot of times, especially when we're doing these things retrofitting, which is about 65-70% of what we do, we're still doing new design build, but we're putting these in existing systems. They're tired of replacing pipe or they had one issue that was just the, the final straw. We don't have those calculations available, so we can do an estimate off of square footage of the coverage area. So, But we prefer to have the gallons, just more accurate that way. And, and I'm sorry, gallons, fire pump 1,500 gallons, or again, the volume of, of water in the pipe? In the, in the piping okay. itself. Just, yeah. just <clears throat> Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay. absolutely. <laughs> so this is the setup for this 500 to 900 system. This air compressor would be doing the 30 minute fill. As I said, there's an internal air compressor. As soon as that 30 minute fill is complete, there's a bypass valve here, just a three-way valve. Throw that, the nitrogen generator takes over supervisory pressure. It's going to fill this tank, and like we said before, maintain supervisory that way. 
for the larger systems, you can have these. You can still have, say, for this one, a, an existing air compressor. If it gets up to 3,200 gallons, that's where we start providing our air compressor because it's involved in the creation process itself. The air compressor sizing still depends on the largest zone, like normal. You're, you're sizing based off a of 30 minute fill capacity. These are the large ones, like I said, 16,000 gallons, 22,000 gallons. We provide that package. The storage tank as it is in this one, is inside. We still provide a refrigerated air dryer even though we're using the PSA technology. We're just staging the air properly to make sure everything is at the maximum longevity of that equipment. Smart track technology, and Toby will get into this a little bit further, but this is something we added to our equipment uh, as of January 1. Just like everything else in the world, everybody wants an app, everybody wants to have mobile, mobile capabilities. That's what this provides, that big brother kind of system for there. There's there's multiple, it can uh, track leak rates, it can track uh, pressurizing the system. Hey, maybe the air compressor is the issue, maybe it's the refrigerator. It can actually do some troubleshooting based off of pressure and gauges in there that we normally would have had to do, run through uh, with a customer over the phone, that kind of thing, or on site. <laughs> so it's just an advanced leak detection based off of pressure. The other thing that we're able to do, and, you'll see, and you see there, just if it was the air compressor that was having an issue, that would have an X in it, or it would flash. And you can actually see this when Toby runs through it, the actual the process of where the air is tracking. It's, it's pretty neat to, to actually get into. We always had an air bypass alarm for our customers for everything, and a leak detection alarm. Air bypass was simply a contact alarm. It lets you know that, hey, this is still air in the system. You're not getting the nitrogen you paid for. Someone needs to throw that switch. Now it's automatic with these newer systems. It automatically does that. Um, the other one is the leak detection system, which we always had. That is uh, basically a fancy name for a runtime alarm. These generators are designed to run three to four hours a day on average. If the generator runs for nine hours straight, it's going to go into alarm, whether it's local audio visual or if they use the dry contacts to go into the building monitoring system. It's not gonna shut down the equipment. It's still gonna operate. It's just to let them know, hey, this thing's been running for nine hours, there's probably a significant leak down there that needs to be addressed before you burn up the compressor, before this thing runs for a month straight and then you have to replace every all the equipment, that kind of thing. Um, that is actually now a part of FM requirements, is to have a runtime alarm after we started doing that, so they, they require that from any generator that's out there. This early warning system is basically just a, is a newer, just a more advanced way of doing that. We added this, we also add an additional year of warranty, which would make that the only generator on the market with two years warranty, which is just, it's, a, it's not a requirement, but it's an option. We also have uh, an option where it can read the purity right there at the generator. Uh, so just another way to say, well, hey, it's not 98% at the, at the auto purge yet, Maybe it's not producing 98% there. Well, now you can know right there. It's producing 98% right there at the generator, so there has to be a leak somewhere in between there and the end of the system. Again, these are optional. This is optional equipment that we're able to program in there if the customer wants it. This is our legacy line. We call that because it's better than saying our old equipment. Um, it's still, we still have thousands of these out there. We have these out there in specifications, so they're gonna be requiring this equipment. We're still producing them, we still have all the parts. It's just to let you know none of our equipment is out of date. It's just, we moved to a more, this was our 15,000 and 20,000 model. Obviously not as sleek as this, where everything's in there in, in, in the cabinet, much more uh, appealing. It doesn't have this industrial look to it. So these were our middle tier units, they were a wall mount. It had the wall-mounted generator, it had the, the, the tank, it had the refrigerated air dryer. Now all of that's in the cabinet. We just tried to make it easier to install, less of a footprint, so that's what we changed. The 650 was the same as the 500, 900 in terms of footprint. We already went over this in terms of what you can ask for us when you're specifying this equipment. Uh, we partner with engineers all the time in terms of we have 2D and 3D drawings available. We have general guide specifications. If uh, they just are doing this, hey, sometimes we'll just get, hey, this is the parameters, it's 900 gallons, eight systems, can you just do that portion of the spec for it? No problem, we, we make sure to tailor it to that specific project. Whatever we can do in terms of helping making things simpler, we're there for, we're, we're a resource for, for everybody in the, in the community. Whether it's, you, want, you have an end user that doesn't know about nitrogen, you want them to know, we can come down and do some training, do a lunch and learn, things like that. That's where I'm, I'm all over the country doing that. Um, whether it's contractors, end users, engineers, that um, we're available resource. The, the, this specific equipment will fill up the 900 gallons system. Correct. But uh, let's say 
what will be the, the time to range of how many gallons would create of nitrogen, let's say per hour or per minute or you know? I'm not sure I understand the question. So it, it will, um, you're gonna fill the system like normal, right, with compressed air. As soon as that goes, that's up to pressure, it will start filling the system with nitrogen. Um, if it, in terms, of, I'm not sure in terms what you're looking for. And this for. will take like two days, three days. It, it depends on the size of the system. Yeah, for for 900 gallons, it might be it might be a week. It, we're, it's really tough to say because oh. all the systems are different. But to come up to that 98 percent purity, it will take a little bit more time, than just <clears throat> like that day. All right. Yeah. And this is just the inside of this cabinet. We're going to take this off for you when it comes to the other section of this, just to show you. Again, there's some misconceptions. We get pushback from contractors sometimes. Well, yeah, this is great. We understand the science. We don't have anybody that can install this. Like my guys aren't trained on this. They won't be able to maintain it. There's three filters. They're all click tight. Uh, Toby will be able to show you just what it is. There's no special tools required. Um, and there's really not much more maintenance uh, in terms of a nitrogen generator as it would be for an air compressor. You're still gonna check the oil. You're gonna wipe things down for the air compressor. We already discussed cleaning that strainer in the auto purge, checking purity that those aren't very, I mean, they're necessary, but they're not labor intensive, they're not time sensitive. It's still something, it's still a piece of equipment that needs to be maintained, but it's not excessive in terms of the daily maintenance that you always have to check and monitor, things like that. So that's just one of the misconceptions about nitrogen we like to touch on. This is actually a case study that all this data was provided to us from a customer that has basically utilized us at this, this all of this data is from 77 facilities. They now have our equipment in over 400 of their facilities nationwide uh, because they saw such a great return in terms of their investment in, in putting these in. Basically, they took all of the data, the number of work orders that they had at each one of their locations, the cost of each work order at each one of their locations to replace pipe, do all this, do all this work because they were having so many issues with their dry systems. And then they took the data once they installed the generators and where it went. So they compared this, which average cost per location was about $26,000, their cost in terms of the labor and the equipment, everything to just put a generator in there and then kind of take out the problem areas after they did the testing to find out where the leaks were, that kind of thing, as opposed to wholesale cost in terms of replacement of the entire systems, which is often sometimes just people are fed up and that's what they do. This offers another alternative. Right here is the line where this was the work orders, this was the cost and the number of work orders where it was going. Right here is where they put the generator in and this is where their costs went. This is where their costs would have gone based on the data they have. Obviously it wasn't going to get better if they just kept doing the replacements. The systems were just going to be in, in uh, service longer. So the number of work reductions dropped 32%, the, work, the cost of each one dropped almost 50%. So. Those are obviously huge numbers, and this, again, isn't our data. This is provided to us from someone that used our equipment. And this was 77. They've now gone on for many more years and now up over 400 locations because of this kind of investment. We have not this detailed data, but we have case studies in every, every different sector you can imagine. Hospitals, stadiums. Again, like I said, we have customers that are willing to provide this kind of thing. This is how much I was spending. This is what happened now great obviously hearing it from someone other than the manufacturer other than the contractor things like that where they might not believe the actual numbers that we're making up uh, and we're that like we're like we're making them up it's uh, it's something that in this day and age you can google anything there's no one no one can hide behind numbers there's always back checks that you can do so this is just great data to have that's it for the dry and pre-action systems uh, if you have any questions obviously I can go back to it you're like me, I, I think of the question like an hour or maybe two days later. You have my, you'll have my information if you need to get in contact with me. Wet systems is obviously much more prevalent down here. So while corrosion isn't as big of an issue in wet systems because there's not as much air, to, there's not as much oxygen in those systems to drive corrosion, it still does exist. Often it's at those high points because there's an air pocket, because that's there you have air, water, and metal interacting, that's where you're gonna have that corrosion, whereas where there's mostly water filling the rest of it. That's why the code has changed. They're now requiring venting in these systems, not necessarily automatic vents that we provide, but they, they are requiring vents in wet systems now. Basically, this is just, you install this, water, you're getting rid of the air pocket, right? The, the issue with these is, and if you've ever seen these, 
they look like everyone else's because they are like everyone else's. Everyone has the same technology. There's no revolutionary change there. Um, they, they all work the same way. You're putting them at a high point. The water will go up. There's a little check there. It might spit. So if this is a water sensitive area, that's where you run into issues. You can either gang drain these somewhere, run them outside, that might be a pain. So everyone in the industry basically um, has a secondary vent option. This is where things do get a little bit different. Some companies have a secondary vent that if that first one, water gets into the first one, it'll collect in the second one. They actually have an indicator light that will go up, that will let you know there's water in the secondary one. We actually have to go up and, and drain that at some point. There's another uh, type out there where there's a pan that collects water that might spit out underneath. Again, probably have to go up there and, and drain that. Go ahead, sir. You know, we go in a lot of water flows and um, it's, there are fires or there are broken sprinkler net. Mm -hmm. You shut the system down, and in an ideal world, somebody would replace that head. Well, we're not in an ideal world. We end up replacing no, it. No, we are not. Restoring the system. And then um, within uh, three, four hours, we're back on another water flow because a certain amount of air came into the system and, and there was a surge. Correct. If we had something like this, when we restore this, a wet pipe system, we turn the uh, Butterfly or OS and mm -hmm. back up. This is in a high part of the system. We can bleed the air out of the system with this thing. Well, normally you have those other options where you can actually just bleed it until the water comes up, kind of thing, and then you can close it off. This is automatic, so this isn't going to be something that it's going to be constantly open. If oh, good. Well, that valve's going to be open. Yep. Right. So if if there is air there, it will close that off. It's not something where you can manually adjust uh -huh. adjust it out, kind of thing. But so our secondary vent, actually, instead of having somewhere where it collects where you might have to take a ladder or a scissor lift to actually drain it, we need to have a secondary installation point. And that way, anytime where you're relieving pressure in the system, where you're doing a test, anything like that, the water will drain back into the system. So that just removes that portion of maintenance because these things are at high points. They're not always the easiest places to get to. So this just helps out contractors love this technology just because I mean, it's not really technology. They just love this design because they don't have to do that. That's not a part of their maintenance. They can just drain it from actually the valve room kind of thing. So that's just a little tweak that we provided. Basically, as we discussed earlier, chemicals really aren't a thing that you can do anymore in terms of water systems. So this is a great step in terms of removing the oxygen because that is the driving force. The next step that you can do is actually nitrogen inerting the system. This is something that it's not something where a generator would be a great application because it would take too long to actually fill the nitrogen into the system. But what you're doing in this process, and we all do it the same way, every manufacturer, you're draining the water out of the system, filling it with high purity nitrogen, and then backfilling with water again. So you're doing that a couple times to make sure that it's up to purity. But the, basically the science behind that is if you're not able to get, maybe, maybe this pipe is too close to the ceiling, you don't have seven inches of clearance to put a vent there, if there's an air pocket there, it's now a nitrogen pocket. So it goes back to the same line of thinking as with, with dry and pre-action systems. There's not no oxygen in there, it's nitrogen. So that's really what this actually does. Um, again, it's, it's, it, the science works, that we have these things everywhere, it does work. It's a little more labor intensive than just putting a nitrogen generator in, plug and play, you're good to go, set up as normal. Anytime you drain that system, you're gonna have to go ahead and do that process again. And because you can't use a nitrogen generator, you either have to use high pressure cylinders or a liquid doer, which um, either way is, again, a little more labor intensive. Nobody really likes working with high pressure cylinders, especially when you're not trained to do those and getting them delivered, that kind of thing. It does work. It's just a little more labor intensive than the generators for dry and free action. Um, so again, we, everybody offers this. It's, it's effective technology, just a little bit more to it. All we have, we regulate the pressure down because if you're doing these high pressure cylinders, you can't have 2,200 pounds of pressure going into a fire protection system. So you have to regulate it down, and then we have a, a port where you're actually making sure that it is above that 98% somewhere else at, at a remote point in the system. Again, everybody puts these a remote point just to make sure you're checking to make sure that that is up to purity. So one thing that we do bring to the table that is, is no one else has out there, it's patented technology. You're still gonna do the vents when you can. You're still going to do the nitrogen inertion process. You're putting high purity nitrogen back filling with water. What we've added as an option is to actually, before you put that water back in, you run it through our deox system and it actually strips the water of dissolved oxygen. So you're talking about parts per million in 10 parts per million in standard fill water, no matter where you are. We're taking that down to parts per billion. 
So the, the thought process behind that is it's, it's oxygen, right? We're not breaking apart the H2O molecule. We're talking about removing what fish breathe in there. If you have water sitting in there and you have nitrogen, those gases are going to want to mix. How, how long that takes is, is debatable. We're still doing a lot of research on that, but the dissolved oxygen in that water will release and try to reach equilibrium and mess with the purity of that nitrogen that you put in there. So if we're removing that from the equation, it just makes everything else more effective. Now, in, in all honesty, at this point, when you're doing this, you're gonna have a system that's only in use when you're filling the system. And other than that, it's just gonna sit there basically and, and collect dust. We think that really the future of this project or product is when we're able to make a mobile unit of this and a contractor can have these on their truck and add it to their service and say, hey, we'll deox your water for you as part of their service, that's when this is really going to take off. We have a few dozen of these out there right now collecting data. The case studies show that it does work. It is effective. It's just a matter of we're trying to find the best way to bring it to market. So it's not something you'll see all over the place at this point, but we, we, we're very excited about once we are able to package it a little bit differently. So. That is for the wet systems. Again, it's always oxygen. We're always trying to remove that from the equation as much as possible. There's just three different levels to do it for wet systems. The vents, the inerting, and then we have this as well. So this system isn't hooked up all the time with the, with the wet system. You only use this when you're filling it. Correct, and then you're removing it, because I mean, you can't take the time to deox it before it puts a fire out, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, you just disconnect it and then it's sitting there um, our first installation, I think it was a college campus, they had eight of these, eight different buildings. They're like, man, we wish we had one of these so we could just do that at each thing. So that's when we were like, yeah, that's probably a better situation. Usually on, <clears throat> on the sprinkler system on the wet si uh, mm -hmm. side, um, there is always a minimum last of pressure. That's why we require the jockey pump mm -hmm. running water. That system ca can be added to the supply for the jockey pump on a small sizes or great question so this only takes a certain amount of input pressure so sometimes you might have to jockey that you might have to take that down and then jockey it back up it depends on each system because like you yeah. said there's there's different ones that are different ways so you might have to jockey it back up after it goes through this system 80 pounds great question yeah 80 pounds inlet pressure so if it's more than that you have to dumb it down a little gotcha. and then you have to build it back up if necessary but it can be hooked up to Absolutely. the jockey pump and yep. just stay there for yeah for normal use Wait, you mean for like yeah, regular yeah, to, sprinkler to use? Leave, yeah, to leave it there to... No, we would want to disconnect it after that gotcha. fill is done. Oh, so okay. the water can just operate as normally. Gotcha. But yeah, for that fill rate, so you're not there all day kind of thing, we would we would want to jock it back up. But you wouldn't want to leave it there in operation for, for normal sprinkler use. Mm -hmm. If there's no other questions, that's my portion of it in terms of the dry and the pre-action. I can give you all my information as well, and I can send this information to you so you can have it as a resource, bring it back to your teams. Um, really just use me uh, if you have any further questions or if you have any opportunities. Maybe you're working on a project that might be a good use for either of these. You just want to get some information on to bring to the customer, let me know. Um, and of course, you guys do service and the warranty of the equipment is for... The I warranty mean, for the generators is one year unless they get that added that added bonus. We actually don't do, I mean, we have a service department that's 24-7. We we're, we're pride ourselves on our service. We're actually not going to be doing that, that would be the installing or the maintaining contractor that does that. Yeah. Yeah. But if equipment broke, then we'll, we'll be able to come out there and insert equipment that way. But as far as warranty, it's in-house parts and labor. So say, obviously, the smaller units, if you had an issue, you could send it back. You go through the nuts and bolts for free and, and uh, send it back out to you. But obviously, the larger system, you want to box up and send it back to us. So. Got it. On the, on the, on the dry um, system you put there, or you, you show, uh, Return of an investment about five years for four point eight for them. Yeah, for that specific what about application. The, the wet system. That's a great question. I don't. We don't have a uh, study in terms of having that all that data in there yet. Right. So I wouldn't be able to put a number on that. But um, again, wet systems, the corrosion isn't as as prevalent, so it might be a little bit more. There's also not as much cost associated with those vents as opposed to a nitrogen generator where you're talking about thousands of dollars. You're talking about those vents are hundreds of dollars and you put them where you need to be, so there's not as much investment that you need to have returned. So I would imagine- yeah, that's the, 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 you know, the vents, it's fine, but the- The inerting process as yeah. well. Yeah, and again, that's relatively inexpensive too, just because the, the okay. regulator and the and basically the purity that you're doing that's again that's not a whole piece of equipment that you're buying it's um it's just it, that cost is much more uh, yeah exactly so if uh
Anything else? I'm going to have Toby take over here and actually have you go through, turn up the equipment on, see how it actually operates, get a better feel for it. Because I mean, you can see it on the screen, but it's different to actually see it and actually uh, put your hands on it, especially with the um, the programming that we have too. It's neat to see that in action as well. Okay, so this will be a little bit repetitive for uh, what Clint's already informed you about, but repetition's good when it's new equipment. So. Again, my name is Joe Bernard. I'm in the service department, South Tech Systems, do a lot of commissioning, field service work. Um, so as Clint explained, both these pieces of equipment utilize the PSA or pressure swing adsorption technology. The two sit beds here on the left side of the cabinet is where that material is, is held, the carbon material. So again, under pressure, basically it'll pressurize one side, then equalize pressure so it doesn't have to start from scratch. That once high side will then exhaust as the other side pressurizes. It'll continue that path as long as air is being called for when the pressure from the system is depleted. Um, both of these models have a cut in and cut out of approximately 60 and 70 psi. So the internal compressor this feeds through a copper cooling coil to try and dry the air as much as possible before going into the system. We get two levels of filtration before going to a solenoid valve, which is a center closed valve, which basically just dictates which of these two vessels is being it's pressurized. Just, Cool air contains less moisture. Correct. Correct. So we're trying to reduce you know that. Just yeah, yeah. again, we're yeah. pressing air, so we're creating moisture. Yeah. We're trying to okay. reduce that moisture as much as possible to protect mm -hmm. this material. Um, so again, that center closed valve dictates or determines which bed is filling. Then there's two other solenoid valves that are going to take that equalizer um, stage into effect. The brains of the operation is going to be this controller on the side. I'll flip around here and turn it on so everyone can actually see it go through the options. But that's, again, the brains of the operation, telling everything when to fire, when to actuate. Uh, fairly simple piece of equipment, low voltage. The power supply has a converter here, so everything in internal is 24 volts other than the compressor. Um, there's nothing on the inside that needs to be adjusted on the user, from a user standpoint. The only time they'll need to do anything inside the cabinet is gonna be your maintenance. Just the routine maintenance is either annually or 1,000 hours, whichever comes first. This particular model is based on a calendar date. That one's gonna be on 1,000 hours. Uh, and then there's also two dry contact Wavo relays. So those two contacts can either be connected to the building uh, monitoring system with an open or normally open or normally closed connection. The bypass is just that. When the system's put in the bypass, it'll sound an audible as well as a display on the PLC, send a signal to the BMS if they choose to monitor that. And then the other is a blast off, which was that runtime alarm that Clint discussed, which is uh, for both of these a 10 hour, or I believe they have a nine hour now, nine hour runtime alarm. So if it runs consistently for nine hours, it's going to go into a local alarm, let you know, hey, if there's a problem, it's not going to uh, continue operation. It will continue working, just letting you know that something's going on downstream, there's a leak, someone knocked the head off, various number of uh, possibilities uh, to reactivate or reset that timer, simply toggle the system on and off using the power switch on the left side of the cabinet, that'll reset that timer. And then from there you can isolate the front end, closing it off with your air maintenance device and make sure that holds pressure on the front end. And then obviously if that holds pressure, you don't, you don't have any loose fittings here, then, then the problem's downstream somewhere. Um, this model also has, again, the automatic bypass. So your feed air is gonna be connected on this left side of the panel. If the pressure is lower or it reaches 50 pounds, drops to 50 pounds, it's going to automatically trigger the cylinder valve in the top of this cabinet to open. Your bypass air will then feed, keep your system pressurized. Once it reaches 60 pounds, that cylinder will close, the generator will take back over. Um, that model does not have, the two smaller models have that three-way ball valve, so you'll set to be assured that when designing that whoever's installing pays attention to the orientation. It's been done more than once where it's plumbed backwards and obviously not going to work properly that way. But that, Again, it's another ease of operation, one simple handle to throw when you need to do the bypass feature, and you don't have to have several different configurations and explain well, this valve does this, that valve does this, this was the generator. Keeps it nice and simple. This would be your outbound port. There's also an extra connection point. So say you have you know, failure on both pieces of equipment for some reason, you have a connection point where you can bring in, roll in a small compressor, keep your system up to pressure, and utilize that port if necessary, but again, I highly doubt you're going to have a failure on both sides, but it's there if necessary. Um, this model does not have the 
optional PIRI sensor in internal. It does have a sample port here, so it's a controlled flow rate out of this port here. So if you had a question that your system wasn't meeting that 98%, you're checking out the remote areas, you're not getting your purity reading here, you want to make sure that the system is working properly, you can actually take a sample right here with your handheld. The handheld is a 3 8 poly line, which will slip right inside this quarter inch line. This handheld device, again, simple to use, it's got two buttons. I can peel the tape off now, as soon as you peel that tape off, the shelf life starts going down on it, so as soon as gas is introduced, it starts to deteriorate in the life of the handheld itself. These are good for about three to four years before they need to be replaced. Come to this nipple, put a screw on, that poly tube. When you're ready to use this piece of equipment, simply power it on, hold the calibrate button, it's going to sample the ambient air, which will be approximately 79.1. And then in this case, if you were going to sample your, sample your tank pressure, or your tank period rather, slipping off that line, wait for it to dial up. Again, 98% or better, typically they're always higher than 98%. And then when using it at your purge device, these are left-hand thread bushings. So again, left-hand thread, you won't have this for each one, so you'll have to keep that with your handheld. Uh, thread that in, do the same calibration procedure, put in your hose, the push connect style fitting, so push out on the other ring, or outer ring, pull the hose out when you need to remove it. If these are in a location, again, that's inaccessible, that you can't get to, that you're gonna have to get a man lift or a scissor lift to get to it every time, you can order additional fittings with the smaller quarter inch fitting, um, which will have this quarter inch line, drop it down to a, a location where somebody can go by, easily get the purity readings, and uh, move on to the next without having to get special equipment in there to get up and access these. Clint already mentioned in the maintenance on this while we're talking about the APS, the uh, wire strainer. Wait poorly on an existing system because you're going to have that contamination in the system already. Existing systems, um, so a little more upfront maintenance on an existing facility. A new construction, say biannual, at least in the beginning. Make sure you get any cutting shavings, oil, anything from the new construction. And then after that, you can usually do that on your annual basis. Big thing is we're trying to make sure that we don't block that flow, which you'll know pretty quickly if you go up there to get your purity. That little butt, makes a little BB inside there that'll be floating at the set point, which you won't have to change again once it's set. Um, however, lots of times when I'm out there, I'll note on the side which setting it's actually at because depending on who actually installed it and who's gonna be servicing it, they call it with an issue, they don't know what the gallon size was. If we didn't go out and do it and make a note of it, then we're guessing. So in that case, if they know they have a, a 900 gallon system or 1650, they just set all the systems within that spec to make sure they're not exceeding the flow rate and capabilities of the equipment. Um, you also want to have these valved off, so anytime you know you're going to do any hydro on the system, valve this off, save yourself the headache of getting any water in this. It does have a check ball inside the device itself. If the check ball doesn't reseat itself, this little screw is utilized to either relieve the pressure, so you close it off, loosen that screw, slowly introduce the air or gas back to the flow meter, and it'll, it'll reseat that check ball. You can also utilize that to basically drain out any water in here. So if you do get a little moisture in here, if you can pull that out, again, use your pressure to blow out the water if you get an excessive amount. Again, this won't be here. You can dial this all the way up, basically open up the, the orifice um, flow rate as much as you can to, to help blow out that, that moisture and, and make sure it's clear. In that case, if there is a, an excessive amount, you may want to just leave it open for the day um, to make sure you dry that out and it's, it's flowing properly before resetting it. So then that valve is just to, to keep water from getting into this valve here? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it would normally be open all the time. The only time you need to close that is going to be to do any, any pressure testing hydro on the system. Um, maintenance, other than that, it's going to be open. And then, say, if you have a facility that gets that power saver, same thing, it's going to be open, but this will flow back to that power saver device and then monitor purity. And ideally, if the system's tight and there's not a lot of already existing leaks, then you should have even less runtime on your equipment, hence the power saver name. If the system's in purity, that system, system should hold that solenoid in the actual power saver device is gonna lock down until that next 24 hour period where it checks the um, system pressure or purity rather again, and then continue that process. Uh, back to the inside of the compressor or the generator here. So as far as maintenance on it, again, we're looking at three filters. The intake filter on the compressor, which is just your standard paper filter. 
cap off, replace your filter. That's about it on the compressor. It is mounted or bolted down initially during shipping. There's a tag on the side that lets you know to remove those bolts before you begin to operate. They're just a standard quarter 20, 7 16 head bolt. So remove those beforehand. We've got these nice braided stainless vibration dampers to keep it from creating any excessive rattling and noise in the cabinet. It'll be a little loud when we turn it on here, but fairly quiet overall, even when it is bolted down. So these are bolted down for shipping because that's going to suspend the air compressor uh, much better than this, like the rubber footies. That was, yeah, I, was, yeah. I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I saw that, but then I saw the screws. Okay, yeah. so that's yeah. just for shipping. Just for yeah. shipping. Yeah. Okay. Right. So uh, that way, I mean, it suppose those rubber footies that oxidize yeah, yeah, yeah. way. Yeah. That's just a much better way to keep that vibration down, the noise. These are in riser rooms next to patients, things like that. We're trying to keep the decibel level yeah. down as much as possible. Yeah. So this will sit up a you know, quarter inch or so off the actual bottom of the cabinet. So these four bolts here, just to keep from beating up the compressor or in this case, uh, that's really it. That one's a little tighter, so it could potentially beat up some of the other components and cause some damage if it wasn't uh, bolted down during shipping. The other two filters, you've got a particulate and a coalescing filter. Let's just take out a different micron level of, of moisture. In this case, it's oilless compressor, so you're really only looking at uh, moisture and possible debris of you know, that are in the compressor after, after wear. They also use that push to connect style fitting, so they've got two drain lines. You've got two push neck fittings on the side of the cabinet as well. So if it is a water sensitive area, you can plumb those <coughs> to a suitable location. Now, most rather rooms, not a big issue. And for the amount of water that's going to be dripping out of here, you may see a, a slight streak down the cabinet, but you'll never see any water gushing out of this thing. So um, it is there if you do have a, an area that is concerned about that, but not really necessary. So to remove these, push up on that orange ring, pull out your poly lines. The outer casing will come out, sometimes the inner bolt will come out at the same time, but there's an O-ring that holds it in place. So give it a little wiggle. This first one is your particulate filter. Your kit is going to come with all three of your elements, as well as new O-rings for the uh, inner bowl as well. This first one has a snap style retainer for the particulate. Just pry it off, twist the retainer and you're going to replace that portion right there. Again, the whole process can be done in you know, 15, 20 minutes max. Um, I didn't mention because we actually have it off already. You know, so you either want to put it in the bypass or for a short of time it's, it's going to be worked on. You can just turn it off altogether. Don't worry about doing the bypass. Uh, replace your filter elements. If there's any buildup, you know, calcium buildup debris inside the, the filter bowls, rinse them out. Don't need to use any solvents. Uh, after you know several years of service, it may be necessary to break down a little further. It's a little snap ring. This whole portion here just unscrews. Remove the snap ring. Remove, remove the the float for the drain, and then you know get in there and clean that a little bit. Just to ensure that there's no debris or or gunk underneath that float that's going to keep it from sealing properly. And you'll know if it's not sealing because you'll feel some relief off the side of the cabinet. When installing them back in, you want to make sure that you get it back to that painted line. If you Put it back in, you still have some of these shiny threads showing. You know it's not properly seated, and that could potentially create a leak point, which would cause the system to run a little bit longer than it needs to run. Again, hand tight, doesn't need to be he band on there, and just get a little snug twist. The other one is the same, the only difference is it does not have that retainer, so it's a more of a foam style filter, and that whole filter will unscrew off of a, a threaded st stem. Place so that portion, your O ring, clean the bowl out, same process. Normal to see some water in there, dump it out at time of maintenance. Otherwise, while it's in operation, if you come to it, it'll relieve itself as the uh, system's operating that float reaches that point of expelling the water. So, again, no special tools. It's, it's a matter of an all three, all three filters come in a kit. It's, this is once a year or every thousand hours, so it's not a um, obscene amount of maintenance that takes forever to do. Or this this model and every other model with that style controller has a filter reset, uh, as well as a reminder that'll let you know it's time to do your, your annual maintenance. The models with that style PLC, again, based on a thousand hours, it'll also give you an alarm. 
Uh, the model below that, the 500, only has a hour meter, so on, on that model, and we're we're not doing any of the membranes anymore, other than no, it's all PSA. Okay, I don't know. If, I know we have some projects that are still. Yeah. Not, we have the not we have yet. the cabinets that we partner with um, Viking on the Fireflex cabinets, uh, where it's a pre-action assembly cabinet, but it actually has nitrogen inside of it as well. So that's that's another one of those plug and play kind of deals that um, just taking it a step further, putting the nitrogen inside the whole pre-action assembly. That still has memory. So, okay, so where I was going with that was the timer. The only one that you're going to see the timer that's not going to give you a, an actual reminder, whether it be the, the stop PLC or that one, is going to be the 500, which will just have a digital hour meter, and that's the one that you'll just basically do on your, your annual maintenance with everything else. Um, this assembly here is a pressure relieving assembly. So anytime the system hits its standby, satisfies that 70 pounds, it's going to dump the pressure off. So if the pressure doesn't have to start under load, it won't start under load. So if something happens and portion of that valve assembly fails, this is just going to hum, it's not going to kick back on. That's an indication that you've got something going on with that solenoid there. Haven't had that happen yet, but we know during testing if we have something going on that that's an issue. Um, again, it won't start under load. Anytime the system is turned off, same thing, it'll dump pressure to normally open solenoid and you'll have no pressure on the system. Uh, as far as the internals, that's really about it. It's pretty straightforward. Again, they're all going to be the same with the exception of the large models are going to have that refrigerator and dryer right inside the system and a little, little different valving configuration, but all, all in all, they're, they're going to be functioning the same, same features. Um, it's a pressure transducer or pressure switch, similar to a pressure switch, it's a little, a little fancier, has a few more capabilities. These valves would always be open. If you get your cylinder in there for your bypass, it check valve to ensure the pressure's not going back through the system. The this style PLC does have a battery. It'll give you a low battery alarm. They have parameters have been set into it, timing, so forth, uh, two point slopes for the cut in, cut out, purity if you have that function. To re replace that, you would have to remove the back panel or the back cover of this PLC, lift the first board, and there's a just a flat lithium wash battery. It's uh, Easy enough to do, you just want to make sure you do it in a timely matter. If you do not and you have a power outage, you'll basically lose those input parameters. The program itself will be there. Quick call, we have all that on file. We can walk through it and get it back in in, uh, in action. You know, that's why you have to bypass. So if that happens, you'll be bypassed for a short time. Any questions on the internal components or operation, how it functions? If not, I can spin it around. Or Powered on, show you the PLC, some of the controller features. Okay, so both this and the other model right now are using this style toggle switch. Uh, moving forward here, I think in the near future we're going to be switching to a, a hardwire style configuration. Uh, but for right now, these near future models will, will still have this. So once it's plugged in, the power button's here, the PLC will illuminate. And then in the bottom right, you've got your on and off button. So after the one comes on, you've got a home screen. It'll basically default to that after no one's touching it. It's inactive for a minute or so. Let's see, so we're still on standby. Uh, before I turn it on, we'll go through some of these options here. Right now, you can see system status will show at the bottom. It's in standby. We had it on yesterday. It's already met. It's satisfied. Or satisfied. It's cut out pressure of the roughly 70 pounds. On your app style icons here, you've got your dashboard, which you can go to. It's a neat little display here. It's got somewhat of an attack on the top here, which shows your N2 pressure in the system. You've also got a conversion to flow, so it will tell you your pressure loss in a flow rate over you know, that current day, that month, basically calculate it off pressure. So you can kind of you can utilize that to see how it how leaky the system, how at all the system is. Again, we'll keep doing it with the system purging. Close your valves off to see if there's any difference in leak rate with the purge valves off, with those intentional leaks we put on there, with what's already existing, especially on an existing system. If you go to this smart track button, it'll give you some other features that you can access if you have these um, with your particular unit. Let's see, sensor graphs. For this particular model, all you have is pressure. Again, we can put flow meters on here, purity monitors, so forth, that are our features that are available as options. 
the, your data log. So you can go to this to see the, again, if you have those optional features, airflow, the N2 flow, the O2 percentage, air temp, put dew, dew point meters on here. These are, again, not you're gonna be your typical installation, but again, data centers, like all the bells and whistles, so those are probably one of the things <coughs> that you're gonna have more options than, than you need. That's where you're gonna see those, and this is where you can monitor those options over a current average and monthly uh, basis. They all come with SD cards that are formatted for the application. Where you can extrapolate the, for that information. Let's see. Well, you can put in status log. The status log just lets you know if it's in good, good status as far as operation and operational. And this one doesn't have any additional features of the internal dryer. The ones with the dryer, the pressure that we're going to supply will let you know if there's a problem based on pressures that it knows it should be seeing for those particular items. And the leakage log, we'll talk about that. It was right from the main menu. You go back to your home. The operations, that was the one that'll let you know all your equipment is working properly. So yes, your compressor's good. You've got your incoming pressure. Again, this one doesn't have that feature on here. It shows you the airflow right now. The tank should be going out if this was open because the generator is up to pressure, meeting that 60 to 70 pounds. Graphs, get another feature, which will show you purity or pressure. This one will be pressure for this application, not one that's gonna be utilized much. You'll basically see a upward slope, standby, down, up, down, up. Might be used a lot more in, it in some other applications, but this there uh, has a feature on here as well. Your alarms. So the alarm status page will only allow you to access it if they are active. Right now, it's telling you your filter status, pressure, blast off, bypass, everything's in a good normal operation, running operation. If it were active, you'd be able to toggle on that icon and it would bring you to another menu letting you know exactly what the issue was, whether it was pressure, how low your purity was. Product info is strictly serial number of your unit, commissioning dates, build dates, and software application that you have for this particular, for that particular unit. And if you go to the next item, it'll give you several other options here. The only option or app that you cannot access is going to be your factory settings. Uh, the alarm settings, you can either turn on, turn off any app, any audible that you don't want to hear. So for instance, the bypass, the bypass alarm, which when I actually turn it on, I can drop pressure so you can hear it. You can silence it, it'll silence itself for a short period of time and then become active again as long as the bypass. If you uh, are going to be doing service on it for a while, keep it bypassed, you can just turn that audible off altogether so you don't have to sit and listen to that chiming. But the uh, access to that, you need a password, password protected, 6557 is the user password on all these applications. And all of that there, because the maintaining contractor can have on their phone and have access to that if they have, if they're connected to the internet, which is, I mean, obviously a huge deal if you don't have to be on site to know that a certain thing, pressure drops, anything like that. That's a, the system will not go into standby immediately at 70 pounds, so when we turn this on, right now it's in standby. If I, Bleed pressure off, it finishes off a cycle. So before it goes into standby, it's got to finish the cycle. So if we're on B, it doesn't stop until it goes through and gets back to A. So it's normal to see that pressure possibly get up to 80 pounds. So just know that 70, it needs to be on the shutdown, shutdown stage. And your communication settings. So the communication settings just that, where you can put in your IP address for the remote monitoring features, and then you would also have to go and download some software off the internet for free, which would allow you to see the same screen, screen images that you're seeing here on the PLC itself. Let's see. And then lastly would be your maintenance items. This will allow you, and more so for a troubleshooting standpoint, you can go to your valve controls and actually manually actuate all the electronics of the system to make sure that it's working properly, that you get air on it, you should be able to flow air. Um, there's no air on the system at that time. You'll just hear the clicking of the solenoid valves. Really helpful for us to be on the phone with somebody to make sure before we start sending out parts that we're making sure that it's actually the issue. And again, your maintenance.
Phoenix alarm, so same thing, being able to turn on or off your purity alarm, so this one doesn't have a purity alarm or purity function, and then your filter. So your filter reset is going to be here when it comes time to change those and you have that active alarm, if you hit that active alarm, it's going to bring you to this screen automatically, and then you can go and hit the change filters up button here, reset, and it'll reset that filter for the next annual change. Same style relay and all the equipment, that gray Wago relay and dry 
Dry contact, normally open or closed position. Other than that, again, same same configuration, just uh, pocket size, almost. <laughs> and we have wall-mounted brackets yeah. available too. That the storage tank, because it's at low pressure, doesn't really need to be mounted any certain way. You have it right underneath the compressor, the side of it, mount it horizontally if you want to. I mean, we've we've seen yeah, it I've, mounted on the ceiling. <laughs> I've had these things in stairwells with a yeah. tank laying on the side, yeah. back in the corner. Um, then again, they had yeah. limited space, so there was no wall mount. They fabbed their own brackets and had it freestanding on a, a bracket on the wall. It was actually, uh, I think it was at a data center, and they had a redundant system, so they were back to back on a, a freestanding. As um, long as it's piped together backup. correctly, that's all that matters. Yeah, the compressors, if it's a compressor we supply, we usually recommend a, a flexible line in between the compressor and the dryer just to make sure you don't have un mm -hmm. unnecessary uh, vibration and potential uh, leak points created in the, in the piping itself. And then minimal minimal maintenance on it. Even if the units with the refrigerator dryer, all they really require is to keep them dust free. And then um, rarely you'll need to change the float assembly. That's the only real maintenance that needs to be done on those. And that typically is diagnosed when there's uh, continuous exhausting from the, the drain line in the dryer. And then your compressor would be standard maintenance, you know, oil change, filter change, belt tensioning, as uh, recommended per that manufacturer, the particular compressor. But yeah, so I mean, like I said, it, there's a lot to come at you with a lot of information, a lot of new information. If you have any questions later today, next week, whenever it is, you have all of our information. Um, if you're working on any specific project and you want to just see how this would incorporate into that, let me know. We can work with you on that. Just uh, utilize this as a resource as need be.